Gary Sutton with Brian Buffard, expert in military justice, and he will be in court today, by the way, uh, working on some of those law-type things. But, Brian, great to have you back on the Gary Sutton Show. Hey, Gary, thanks for having me. Brian, you know, a lot's been made of Bo Bergdahl this week. We had some word earlier in the week from some sources that uh, he has had a charge sheet put out against him that is going to accuse him of desertion. I know we've talked to you about this before, and you're very careful to make sure that, you know, when it comes to legal stuff, we don't want to do too much presumption here, obviously, ahead of time. But now we see that uh, one of the five hostages that uh, he was traded for earlier, although we don't trade for hostages, uh, and that's been an argument all week long, has had contact with the terrorists in that particular part of the world, which is not totally surprising. Your thoughts on all these developments this week? Sure. Uh, and let's take the, your first point first. Uh, we, we did see a, a, a lot of hoopla in the media on Tuesday which basically came from one person, and that is a retired Lieutenant Colonel Intelligence Officer. Who Lieutenant Colonel Tony Schaefer, some, right? Say again? Lieutenant Colonel Tony Schaefer, I believe was his name. Right, you know. right, right. And I, and I, don't, I don't know Colonel Schaefer, uh, but, but I, you know, I, I do believe that his information is, is faulty on some level, and, and I, I say that for a couple of reasons. Number one, uh, if Sergeant Bergdahl had a charge sheet, that... Is, is something that number one, the army would would never deny. I mean, that's a that's a like, record, and it would be. I mean, I can't even conceive of doing that and then li- and lying and saying you hadn't done it. Uh, and then the other thing was, some of these reports uh, said some things that were actually legally impossible. Uh, NBC News on Tuesday reported that Sergeant Bergdahl was to be charged with desertion, but that the government was not alleging that he had the intent to stay away permanently. And that's, that's a legal impossibility. That would be like saying he's been charged with theft, but the government is saying that they don't believe he took anything. But he didn't you know? really mean it or something along that line, yeah. Right. So I think that's just bad info. And obviously it doesn't mean that he's not going to be charged with desertion, but I just don't believe that that's happened yet. And, of course, the, the Army and the Pentagon have, have said that no decision has yet been made. Now, one of the things that you know is out there, that the political side of this, that the president and the parents at the White House with – the White House, White House and all their uh, people they sent out saying, hey, this was the right thing to do. And obviously now that is the case if the Army comes up and says we are going to file a version, that certainly puts egg in the face of the White House, to say the least. By one school of thought, you're right. And I, and I think that when that happens, you know, everybody's going to be piling on the president. And, and you know, personally, I'm, I'm not a, a President Obama fan by any stretch. I didn't vote for him. But uh, I, I think that that's a little bit unfair, and, and I'll, I'll tell you why. Go ahead. My, my view on this, Gary, is uh, whether or not Sergeant Bergdahl committed a crime, to me, is a completely separate question from do we bring our people back, okay? And so whether Sergeant Bergdahl is, is, is guilty or innocent, to me, if I'm, if I'm the president, it, it doesn't matter so much. I have a responsibility to do what I can to bring American soldiers back. And if he needs to face justice, let him face justice here and not just brutality from a from a savage enemy that's a great point absolutely great point and i think that uh you know i think for a lot of people though uh you know they want to see that justice coming i is it unusual to have the amount of time uh that's gone by since just then uh, since sergeant bergdahl was brought home in order to bring this kind of case about i I do think so i I do think that it's taken a, a surprisingly long amount of time these investigations Number one, they tend not to be terribly complicated. It's not a criminal investigation. It's a fact-finding investigation. Number two, much of the investigation was actually done back in 2009 when PSC Bergdahl left his unit. Uh, they, you know, they knew it was an issue then. Uh, they, they knew he had been captured, but that still didn't prevent them from doing the investigation of the circumstances of his departure. So they interviewed everybody there, and they, they, they got all that information. So... Anything that was done here now uh, by the the current investigating officer was able to to uh, you know to stand on the shoulders of that investigation. So that's another reason why I'm I'm a little little surprised that it's taken so long. But on the other hand, it's a very politicized issue, and, and I'm sure that that's playing into it. When you look at, at what is said from the State Department during the course of the week. Uh, Jen Psaki said, it's unfair to say that we negotiate with terrorism. I think the world knows where the United States stands. We have positions for a reason. It's not just to have that position, which is kind of redundant, but uh, we never said U.S. won't negotiate with terrorists. Our line is that we don't make concessions. Um, a lot of people would say <laughs> with the uh, with this guy, 
the five big wigs that left uh, Gitmo uh, that uh, and the president said later on, well, if we find that they are getting back involved with ter- terrorism again, we can go get them. But one would say, well, why do you want to let them go in the first place? Like people say how crazy golf is. You have the ball. Why do you want to hit it away from yourself again? Same thing here. Why do you want to let terrorists go out where they could potentially get back in, especially with what we're seeing with ISIS and ISIL right now? Well, yeah, and, and, and you know, holding these people without trial for, for years and years and years is not going to suddenly make them not want to be terrorists. You know, that, to me, whether or not these guys get back with, uh, with their, their old cohorts and, and start making IEDs again, to me, that's, that's pretty obvious. I mean, why wouldn't they do that? That's, that's what they want to do, and that's their ideology. Yeah, I mean, prison didn't make them kinder, gentler terrorism uh, terrorists, and uh, I think that's a great point. We've had a lot of talk this week with the Jordanian situation, a pilot taken by ISIS from Jordan, also a Japanese hostage, and whether or not we should trade hostages for, um, you know, killers, for terrorists, like this woman who's a bomb carrier in uh, that they have in Jordan right now. Uh, what are your thoughts about that? Is the United States correct on the policy uh, on on not wanting to trade, and yet at the same time, uh, we did that for Bergdahl in a sense. And you look at what's going on with Jordan right now. Should we be trading with groups like ISIS? I, I don't think that we should, but at, at the same time, I also don't think that we should have a blanket policy. I think we should view things on a case by case basis. I mean, any, anybody yeah. who thinks that we don't negotiate with terrorists, I mean, to me, that was disproven on 9 11 when we let the Saudis fly in the only plane that was in the air. To get out of here. I mean, exactly. we're negotiating with terrorists there, as far as I'm concerned. So I think it's a case by case basis, but I, I do think that every time we do it, it emboldens them and it sends the message yeah, you know, let's capture one of theirs and we'll get 10 of ours back. And especially trying to get some kind of world recognition right now, as though they haven't, but uh, again, they want to be considered to be a legitimate force in the world. And, and one would have to say, when you negotiate with them, that happens. Yet at the same time, we're torn by the idea that lives get taken in that situation. And But the more you negotiate, it, it's such a catch-22 situation, the more you negotiate, the more they're going to be emboldened to keep that kind of policy going. I, I agree. And, and, and the more we engage in questionable activities overseas ourselves, the more we become a target for that. So I'm not saying that we should stop doing everything we're doing, but I, I do think that we should always be reevaluating. You know, why are we over there? What are we doing? Who appointed us to be the world's policemen? I think maybe we win more hearts and minds right. by, by, you know, drawing back here and, and focusing on ourselves and focusing on our freedoms and making our country that beacon that everybody else would want to be like. We're talking with Brian Buffard, who is an expert in military justice. So, you know, we come to the point of Gitmo, uh, and the president basically has intimated, well, you know, Gitmo, the longer we keep it open, the more terrorists we create and the, and the more they see us in the bad light. Do you necessarily agree with that? You know, I, I, I really go back and forth about my, my feelings about Gitmo. We, we obviously, we, we, have, we have captured people. We can't just summarily execute them. I'm sure there are voices that, that want to do that, but that's not who we are. I understand. Not who we should be. So we have to keep them somewhere, but I think they should have been tried and either convicted or freed years ago. And I think the fact that we haven't done that is a, is a stain on our honor. You're in the legal uh, business. Uh, what, what rights do uh, would-be terrorists or uh, enemy combatants have when they are uh, actually taken and put into a place like Gitmo or any other kind of prison around the world? What rights do they have? Well, they, they should have general human rights. Uh, they, they should have the right not to be tortured. Uh, beyond that, it, whether the full Geneva Convention applies to them is, you know, really in, in the case of a non-state actor, it's, it's up to us whether or not we want to extend them those protections. And I think it's a good idea. There's a, there's a logic behind the Geneva Conventions that, that basically says we want to treat you in the way that we hope you will treat our people when you capture our people. And when we, when we deal with state actors, oftentimes that logic works. When we deal with religious ideologues like, like ISIS, uh, you know, it may or may not work, but it, it has to right. be tried, and we have to be able to say, we tried everything. Brian, I really appreciate you being with us this morning. Always a pleasure having you on the show, and I look forward to our next time very, very soon. Definitely, Gary. Take care. Thanks so much. Take care.